Well, good evening, everyone. Let everyone kind of get settled. Come on in. Good to see you. Or imagine seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> Hope everyone is somewhere dry and riding up the storm. We have a good crowd signed up for tonight, so I'm gonna just let everyone roll in. This part's always the most awkward as we wait. <laughs> I should have been playing some Bon Jovi. While we wait. At least not like the chorus. It's probably what most people know. Living on a prayer. Oh, thanks, Kristen. <laughs> We will uh, explain what that reference is a little bit later on, and yeah. everyone will laugh. Yep. Um, so it is, yeah, a little bit after 5.30. Let's go ahead and get started if, if uh, Robert and Liz, you're ready. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, again, welcome everybody. My name is Celeste Feta. I'm Director of Education here at VMFA, and welcome to VMFA Fridays After Five, A Taste of Art. And this week we'll be focusing on Rosé. Joining me as always is Liz Skirpin, a muse manager. And tonight we welcome Robert Pence from Robin's Cellars. Hi, Robert, welcome back. You've been yeah. at One Taste of Art before, so nice to see you again. Yeah, um, I am going to remind everyone who have been here before, or if you haven't joined us, welcome, um, on some Taste of Art tips. So if you're pairing wine with us this evening, uh, we'd encourage you to open that first bottle now as we get situated and set up. Um, and thank you. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Liz. Very easy, right? Little effort there. <laughs> um, a reminder that you can see us, but because this is a webinar format, we cannot see you. I always say use that to your advantage as much as you'd like. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about art and wine tonight, and we're going to be asking for your impressions. If you feel comfortable sharing, we'd encourage you to do so in the chat feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. We'll be keeping an eye on that chat box um, as the evening rolls along and try to answer your questions or, you know, reinforce your comments as you as you make them read them back to the group. Um, but please do keep to the chat as opposed to the Q&A, and that just helps us keep an, our eye on one box as opposed to two. Makes it much easier for everybody. Um, so that is how we will work it uh, tonight. So get your first glass ready. Um, and I'm actually going to kick it over um, to both Liz and Robert um, to answer the ever pressing question around rosé. Is rosé sweet? You're going to head it off? I'll, I'll head it off. Uh, it. And uh, the quick answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It, it, yeah, if the term rosé is being used, uh, it, it, you should uh, assume that it is a dry wine. Um, uh, if it's called a white Zinfandel or a white Merlot, uh, then those would be sweet. Uh, but otherwise, if it is, it is termed rosé on a wine list or in a, on the bottle in a wine store, uh, it is going to be dry. Absolutely. I think we get that that question the most in the restaurant when people are ordering rosé. We do, yeah. I mean, in America, uh, starting in the what, late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. with uh, the creation of White Zinfandel by the Sutter Home Winery, uh, Americans think that peak wine equals sweet. Uh, and it's only been in the last 15 years as, as European rosé became more popular in America uh, that it grabbed, like, now completely overtook it. There are very few restaurants that sell white Zinfandel today, uh, even fewer wineries that make it. And almost every restaurant at this point has rosé on their list and they are all dry. Do you want to talk a little bit about how they're made? Sure, yeah. Make so, some rosé? Yeah, so rosé, yeah, so a rosé is uh, typically a wine that is made with red grapes, but it's made like a white wine uh, so that the fermentation takes place quickly 
and they leave some skin contact, sometimes for less than 24 hours, rarely more than 72. Uh, the skin contact is where the color comes from in both rosé pink wines and even uh, full-on red wines. Uh, the juice in all grapes is actually white, except for a very few couple of random grapes out there in the world. Um, sometimes the, uh, in this case, this is a vin gris. So that means that it is kind of like what some people refer to as an orange wine and that it is the skin contact, the color. It has not actually got free runoff juice where they blended red and white together to achieve the pink. Um, it's, it is a natural occurrence, uh, which is pretty cool. And what does that like? What does that yield in it, as flavor wise or texture wise? Or flavor and texture. It, the having the skin contact is what gives you the weight on your palate and the spice that you find in the wine. Um, that's what would make it different than a, a white wine, um, because you don't typically have that skin contact in white wines. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it adds a layer of complexity, I think. Of, Most certainly, yeah. Which makes it so enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. Rosé has now, it's become so popular here in America. It's one of the leading uh, wine categories, especially in the warmer months. But there are so many restaurants now that keep a rosé on their by the glass list year round at this point. And in retail world too, where it used to maybe be a seasonal section that they would, you know, shrink another part of the world or a part of their store to add in the rosés, sell through them and move on to the next year. Now they keep them there. Now there's certain brands or wineries that go in and out of stock, but for the most part, there is always some rosé available. So why, I've always wondered this and I've never asked, why is it, you know, in the springtime when all the rosés come out? Is it, is, and I know they're young wines typically, so is that when they're I think being it's, made and that's yeah, when they come out and hit the market? Typically, I yes, know. I think so. They are, they are, uh, often harvested earlier mm -hmm. uh, because they don't want as much sugar and then the phenolic ripeness, they want to be lower. So they typically do get harvested before the same red varietal that mm -hmm. would be go into red wine mm -hmm. making. Um, the fermentation time, like I mentioned, is shorter as right. far as for the skin contact and all of that stuff. And then it's just resting on the lees. Uh, and this one in particular uh, is lees uh, rested. And that means the naturally occurring sediment from winemaking is not filtered out and it acts as a preservative as well. So it's a happy coincidence that the summertime and the springtime when the weather is awesome and when rosé is coming out at the same time. Yeah, it yeah. Together. It, 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 it's a perfect coincidence and, and it this is the type of wine I drink at this time of year. Yeah. It's very goes with wine. Uh, it also, <laughs> <laughs> also goes uh, fish, salads, uh, cheeses. There's very few things. Barbecue, pizza. Sitting outside on the beach, sitting on your back porch. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, yeah. Chilling with friends, doing Zoom calls with friends, you know, <laughs> and any any number of things. Rosé is always appropriate. Cool. Well, I hope that demystified some of the rosé. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Get a lot. And uh, time frames, too. You, it's, uh, you can drink it earlier in the day. It's more acceptable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that your rule? I get maybe so. I'm, I, I'm a person, so I'm just trying to promote, uh, dr you know, drinking. Very good. <laughs> so there's a question that's come in. Do white wines, Sir Lee's, L-I-E, have skin contact? Uh, they can. Sir Lee just means on the lees. So that just means that it's it sits on the lees, stay in the water. They're not drink or in the water, in the wine. They're not separated out. Uh, Typically, Chardonnay is probably the white wine that sees the most uh, on the lees, but you'll see Muscadet. Muscadet, yeah, I was say, Muscadet is a very common one. It's a, obviously, by the term, it's a French term, uh, so it would happen the most often in their wines, but it has definitely been uh, copied in Napa and Sonoma uh, with many, many of the California winery Chardonnay producers doing it. You don't see it much with like Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio. Um, but uh, it, typically Chardonnay, but Sir Lee is great. It's always a sign of quality. And that'll add to the body, yes? You yeah. Get a little bit of roundness yes. to it. Yes, it does. Um, uh, batonage, I think, is the term for when they stir the leaves and mix it into the wine, um, or they rack the Makes barrels, sense. and that's where they maybe don't stir it, but they've got a cork on it, and they 
either with a forklift or something, they move it in a way that swishes the wine around and mixes the leaves in with the wine more. Uh, and a lot of times you'll find wines that sit on the leaves are also bottled unfiltered uh, yeah. and result in some cloudiness, but uh, typically that means higher quality. Um, and I'll just remind, I see some hands being raised. If you have, do you have a question or comment? Just if you would pop that in the chat, that would help us get to it and make sure we answer. Okay, great. So that is a great setup. Um, given a little bit of background um, for us to launch into our first selection of the evening. Um, and that is the Bonnie Dune Vineyard Rosé. Yes, so. So if you, again, if you're um, drinking that along with us, now's the time to pour. So I'm gonna do the same. And tell us a little bit about this one. So Bonnie Dune is a uh, iconic American winery. Uh, it was started by Randall Graham in 1983. And he was known as the original Roan Ranger, uh, meaning he was the first guy or among the first people to plant Rhone Valley wines, and those would be Grenache, Syrah, Mouvedre, Cinso, Carignan, Grenache Blanc, uh, and a whole bunch of other grapes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, the big guys. yeah, a lot of the those are the big names, and then there's even more obscure ones. Uh, but he was the first to plant those in California, and then most specifically in Southern California. Um, the, the winery is in Santa Cruz, so that's three to four hours south of like Napa, Sonoma area. I got the map up. Or actually, sorry, I was thinking it was closer to Santa Barbara, my bad. <laughs> um, but that's still further south in 1984, 83, there was no American wine industry. You have to imagine that's only a few years after the Judgment of Paris. Robert Mondavi had barely started. I don't know if Woodbridge existed. Um, it's not at all the world it is today. So for someone to plant not Chardonnay, not Cabernet, and not Napa Valley was just out of left field completely. And he was so far ahead of the curve because now <clears throat> that is the central coast is the volume of all California wine. Napa and Sonoma are limited by their size and only produce but so much and don't even make up 10% of what is sold from California. Um, the, I didn't know it was that little. It's very little. Uh, the bulk sense. comes from the central coast. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, because it, size wise. Yeah, yeah they're, they're very small little spots. Yeah. Um, so that's just super cool. Um, he is a trip. He, he uh, if you ever uh, have a chance to Google him, he's been on the cover of the Wine Spectator many times. Uh, one of the original ones in the early '80s was uh, him dressed as um, Lone, Ranger. Lone Ranger, as the Roan Ranger, and it's a pretty goofy looking picture if you type it. <laughs> no, we forgot to add it. Let me. I'll I'll go forward a little bit so you can see who we're talking yeah, about. There's Randall. Uh, he he is uh, a, a total California hippie. Um, long hair, speaks very slow. He was actually part of our uh, work Zoom call last month. So I, I got to experience uh, tasting with him in this manner, just reversed. And <laughs> uh, he was very pleasant, nice, super intelligent man. Um, he is uh, credited with being the pioneer of screw caps being used on premium wines and uh, helping to change the <laughs> viewpoint from screw caps only being used on inexpensive wines, but to actually that it's a great vessel or capsule for a vessel to have because you can't have a corked wine with screw cap. Mm. The, the TCH isn't there. Um, the wine itself too uh, is a lot of fun. They also don't take themselves too seriously if you want to back up yeah. slides to the label. Um, so aliens, I don't know if y'all can see the, or if you have a bottle at home, but the top of the screw cap there has a alien head on it. And then on the label itself, you see there's a, uh, cigar, uh, alien there, uh, beaming up people down in the vineyard. And that's a weird, <laughs> fun, true story, uh, that they mentioned on the back label where in the 1950s in, uh, rural France and wine country, there started to be UFO sightings. And in the village of chateauneuf de pop uh, the mayor there was not into that. And so he did, like, 
decreed through the local legislature that aliens should not be permitted to land in that region <laughs> at all ever and they put it on the books it is legit law <laughs> in that left department. no aliens are allowed to land in the vineyards and would you guys believe it it's held up no aliens <laughs> landed in the vineyards. That, you know of. that we know of that we know of. but uh yeah so it worked and um so that's the that is what the image on the front is uh, there's a lot of fun stuff where it says pink wine of the earth uh, there on the label. Uh, so just a lot of fun. Very serious winemaking, but not very serious marketing. That the, the rosé beam that's coming down also <laughs> is very indicative of a classic French label. Yeah, you know where they have the shading. Oh, the that's, yeah, yeah. It is very, that's because if you just look at it, you don't notice the detail. It does remind me of a, a mm -hmm. classic French label in that way. Yeah. yeah. That's well, right. even the building, I mean, it's very French in its architecture, um, sort of like, like chateau kind of feel. Vin Gris, the cigar, you know, the whole, yeah. all of it is uh, very... And what's the cigar significance? I, I think that's what the UFO uh, looked like to the, the oh, people. That makes sense. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Peter was, so my husband was saying too, there was, there's some kind of like rule about smoking cigars in the vineyards too in mm. France that is a no-no. Maybe, I, I'm not, I'm not privy Could to be it. a little like whatever France, I don't know. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> there's a lot of rules. They yeah. have more about their wines than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to know what the punishment is for an alien that does land in the vineyards in France. Like, is there a fine? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of so I don't many, know. Just I mean, interested. Uh, I'll have to Google it. To fill out afterwards. <laughs> after and I have to like admit too, when I first, you know, saw the the label, I did not notice the UFO at all. Like I was really focused on, you know, the foreground, what was happening in it. So it was a great story to hear and kind of like beg to look closer, right, at, at the label. Yeah, yeah I, this is a wine I, that uh, is new to our distributorship uh, for selling, so it's one we're, we're featuring now often, and so I've done a couple other tastings out in the public with it, and yeah, you'd be surprised. People overlook mm -hmm. the whole, they don't notice the pink wine of the earth, but it's a lot of fun getting to point it out. It's a lot more fun than other wine labels where you have to point things out that are not nearly as uh, fun to talk about. Yeah. I don't often sure. have California Central Coast rosé either it's not as plentiful as you would think of a provence or anything french so this is a treat to have it is and it's very provencal in style we'll we'll taste the hampton water next mm -hmm. which is is a true provence rosé um and and as we, we mentioned a couple of times uh randall uh has been trying to emulate french wine the entire time um and he does a really good job it's not very easy to do a thing that people don't uh, often think about with what separates American and French wine. And the biggest thing is temperature, climate. Mm -hmm. uh, California, it's hot, sunny, 300 plus days a year. France is not. Maybe Provence a little bit more so than yeah. the northern regions, but um, where the Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, the Rhone, the Rhine, or uh, the Alsace, all of that, those, they're gray. It's cold. Uh, so the wines develop a lot differently. Uh, and that's why they're not as fruit forward and alcoholic. Mm, yeah. The uh, ABVs are almost always lower on European wines uh, for, for those reasons. Um, so the fact that he can make a wine from such a hot place uh, really shows the restraint, shows his his winemaking style. Their, their biggest thing too now is trying to have as little intervention as possible, meaning the most natural, uh, the most sustainable in every way. Uh, all practices of the business, uh, which is pretty cool too. Yeah, it does have a lot of, so when I look at, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, more Provence style rosés, I always think of them as leaner, as having that pale yellow, pink color, mm -hmm. peachy color. Same and not some like, people. That's perfect, yeah. Not quite a, a dark, darker. Mm -hmm. What you would see in rosés, I think in, um, more southern regions of the world. Yes. And those tend to be more fruit forward in my experience. Mm -hmm. More spicy or have a little bit more other to it. But uh, strawberries and cream, I think, is your typical mm -hmm. Provence. And this does deliver a lot of that. Yeah, it really does. And this has so many, I don't think it even mentions all the grapes on the package, but it has, I want to say, eight oh. grapes, mm -hmm. something. Oh, like wow. That. 
Yeah. And this is a great, is, are those sort of shown on this map too? This is a great image of the vineyards at Bonnie Dune. Mm -hmm. Kind of how and small. Grenache, Grenache Gris, hence the, yeah. the Vin Gris. Um, the Ferment is a cool, that's a, that's a lesser known grape that's mostly grown in uh, Hungary. Uh, it's like the Royal Tokai, that's the grape that goes into that. Um, so, you know, Senso over there on the right, uh, that's a blending grape that's usually grown in the Rhone. So it, it's just very non-typical uh, stuff for a California winery. They, there are not many people who have Senso, Ferment, Grenache Blanc, and Grenache Gris. Those, those are very not typical uh, California grapes. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess Bonnie Dune is the name of the vineyard. Does that have any particular significance or, or story? It sounds very Scottish to me. Yeah, I don't know that. If I, mm. I that's know, not for, in the. I know. For all the years I've, <laughs> I've been around Bonnie Dune, I have no idea. It's probably, a, if I had to guess, it's probably just some fun nonsense that he came fun up nonsense. with. Because he, he mm -hmm. uh, I, I got to see one one time, but he, he made his own version of the National Enquirer uh, that he paid to have printed color ads, everything, all of it make believe, mocking the wine industry, himself, his counterparts, like contemporaries. Uh, and this was like 20 years ago. The, um, a buyer at another account of mine actually has it. Oh, really? Yeah. And, cool. and let me uh, see it one time. It's really pretty funny. So he's, he's just a very eccentric, awesome, fun guy who makes delicious wine. Makes delicious wine. Yeah. <laughs> so, as we're, you know, again, if anyone at, at home is tasting along um, and wants to share kind of what you're getting from this wine, um, either on the nose or on your palate, please feel free to drop that in. And, you know, Liz and Robert, like, if you want to describe that to you, I mean, for, first, like the nose, it smells so good. I don't, I'm not going to get fancy with my words. I just feel like no, and maybe it's, you know, and I don't know if it's like the atmosphere right now. It's, it's really humid here, um, you know, where I am. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a, and I'm in like a side porch. So surrounded by plants and, and, you know, so I, I'm getting, it just feels very um, earthy to me, kind of that wet. And I don't know if it's, that's that what's going on outside is influencing that or not. Um, but I think the uh, the terroir does show, show some. Yeah, uh, you get that that stoniness and that minerality, mm -hmm. um, and that comes from the soil content. Mm -hmm. The uh, fruit that would be coming from those those I think more on the, the red grapes that are being used, mm -hmm. so, uh, Grenache Gris, the uh, Cinso, that type of stuff. That's what's going to give you those more full bodied and um, rounder fruit flavors. Uh, the Grenache Blanc. Uh, ferment, there's probably pool in this, I would imagine. Um, those are what are gonna give it a little bit more of that levity and mm. um, help to kind of tie it all together. Because again, if it was only those heavier reds, we wouldn't be talking about as a Provence style rosé. It might be, you know, a, another further south uh, area, maybe a Puglia or something like that mm -hmm. from Italy. Um, Strawberries. Mm -hmm. Right, strawberries. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Strawberries, raspberries. Those are the like your, if those what your rosé should taste like. And it's, <laughs> some, I mean, it's kind of comforting when you open when it's that time of year and you open a bottle of rosé and you smell it and you get that strawberry smell. You're like, oh, yeah. summertime's coming. Yeah. Just that that total experience. I think that comes back to me every year where I'm like, it's like just like the little um, entree into into mm -hmm. spring and summer, and I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think for a lot of us that are wine fans, you know, when it, when it's finally hit that first warm day that you're like, it's rosé time. You find yeah. the last of your previous year's vintage, you know, your, your 2018 or 19. <laughs> so, hey, people do. Th I will say this also. People think you have to drink the most recent vintage. Not true. Uh, oftentimes, especially with the better quality stuff, um, it getting it older vintage can be very nice. So how does it change? The, I mean, obviously it depends. Um, I would why. say the, for me, the, I've found that the brightness kind of fades a little. Mm -hmm. um, you get more of the roundness, mm -hmm. but more depth into it. Okay, cool. Um, but it is typically on wines, more like the, the, the Provence, like we'll have next with the Hampton water that, that have that. I and mean, this has ageability too, but um, definitely in the, in the higher price points, you get more ageability. They make it to last long.
And I'll just, so, speak, I'll speak to the food. Yeah. What are we eating here? I'm going to say, so whenever I think about spring and summer and rosé, I just want to sit outside on a deck and snack. So I kind of went to a snack theme of, of the night tonight, because I don't really focus on any of our snacks. And I do feel like um, a salad and French fries and rosé is my go-to for the springtime. But this salad we have right now um, is perfect because it is strawberries and French cheese and a champagne vinaigrette. And it's, oh no, green goddess, I'm sorry, green goddess dressing. So you get all those herbal qualities to it, which I think goes so well with the wine. So the strawberries, the cheese, the hard cheese and the herbal quality, I think are very nice with mm-hmm. the wine. And then I went with um, pate, just classic, classic pate that we have on our menu right now. And it's so good. And the mustard and the pepper and the onion, mm-hmm. everything is nicely balanced mm-hmm. with the wine. So I just doing think the- that's a great, Great combo. Uh, totally. And doing different bites, you know, maybe you put the pate and mustard on one mm-hmm. bite and see how that pairs with the wine. Or mm-hmm. then another one, I see there's like little red peppers, I think, yep, or onions. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, yep. You could, you know, add one or two of those and see how that affects the wine or what what nuances you get. Here's your question. We, we know this answer. <laughs> Didn't Randall Graham sell Bonnie June to yes. War Room last year? Does he still... Does he still have the Santa Cruz tasting room or did that close? I don't know about whether the tasting room and stuff closed, but he did sell the winery. Um, He does still make the wine and work there. Um, Basically, he's old and doesn't want to deal with the business aspect anymore. He just wants to make wine and do his thing. So he did, he did sell it to the war room guys. They, uh, we sell there. That's actually how I mentioned it was new to the distributor I work for. Uh, We sell the rest of the war room, ah, war room portfolio. That is hard to say. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and uh so we we uh worked uh with the other distributor who used to sell it to get it over into our portfolio um and it's actually been a really good thing uh for the bonnie dune winery at least in virginia um i've sold it i've worked for a couple different distributors and i've sold it more than once um so it's moved around some it's it's had some ups and downs over the years i haven't um, been shown it until you showed it to me and then i used to sell it when i lived in Austin many years ago 10 plus years ago yeah and I hadn't been shown it until you brought it and it brought back such good memories to me I was like "Ooh, bring that yeah, yeah. and and I think they've honestly done kind of a, a good thing to it so when it was just Randall's again he's an awesome fun eccentric guy but they made like 17 wines and some of them needed to be aged for several yeah. years before they were ready to big drink chewy wines. Yeah, some big really chewy wines crazy big chewy wines yeah. is what his, I remember. his personal style has changed from that mm-hmm. where he wants to make these wines be more like burgundy which is still funny because they're not pinot noir or chardonnay <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's what he's going for and uh, the change is that now there are four wines there's the uh, Vin Gris, the Picpoul, the um, Grenache Blanc, and the Vin Cigar Rouge. And that's all they make. And he mm. actually changed the blend. The, if you've had the Cigar Volant Rouge in years past, uh, that used to have a very large percentage of Mouvedre, which is a big, chewy, needs a long time to evolve uh, blending grape from the Rhone. It's the M in a GSM, if you've ever had, it, had that acronym before. Um, that's no longer in the wine. Uh, that has been removed and replaced with Senso. And that's why the new vintages are ready to drink now, uh, softer and actually at lower price points, which yeah. is pretty cool too. Cause the, the both, like when I sold this for the previous distributor, it was like four or $5 more per bottle than it is now. And I don't think it actually tasted better. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's rare when that happens that oh. something doesn't improve, but <laughs> this would be that case. <laughs> so uh, as you're enjoying this one, we're going to show some art and that, and, you know, drink your pink wine as we're looking at some pink art. The theme for the art tonight is, is think pink. Uh, we're just kind of, uh, right in, right in that color scheme, right through, right through the art. And I've selected this work, uh, for Micah, for Michael from, um, Moonstrips Empire News. This is by Eduardo Polozzi. Um, and I feel like vibes so well with Randall. I mean, I feel like the winemaker would just really dig this work and this artist. Um, it's kind of a happy, ha- I know I found, I wanted to use this before I even knew the whole story of of the Bonnie Dune um, vineyard and it just works out so well. I'm just very excited to share this with you. 
Um, so this is a box of 100 prints. So uh, the elephant is part of one of 100 and they're all different and they come in a hot pink formica box. Um, which is pictured on uh, the right hand of your screen, sort of, and every box is ordered differently. Um, and he really wants, wanted the um, owner of the box to sort of curate it themselves and kind of figure out which ones to put in order and you could move it around. Um, so it gives you sort of ownership over how you experience the work. Um, and he himself, and, I, and again, I just show you the front piece of that, uh, that stack. So it's sort of, um, it's all screen printed or um, a printed, printed each, each one on kind of a cardstock material. Um, this is the cover piece and it says Moonstrip Empire News, Eduardo Pelosi, um, the artist's name kind of in these big bold graphic letters. And you see a picture of him on the right by Ida Carr from the National Portrait Gallery in the UK. Um, and he's actually Scottish. He was born in Leith, uh, an area of Edinburgh, my mom's hometown, actually. Uh, Leith in itself, her neighborhood, so know it well. Um, and born to uh, Italian immigrant parents. Um, and he studied arts and um, went to uh, set up a kind of studio in uh, London eventually and um, is really well known, and this is another great picture of him um, by Nigel Henderson from the Tate Gallery. Very, it had a quirky sense of humor, you can see by this photo. Um, and on the right, um, this is a work that he's very famous for. I was a rich man's plaything um, from a series called um, Bunk, uh, made in, the in 1947. So pretty early on, and it's really the first, he's really credited with bringing, with starting the British pop art movement. So. This is the first time in a work of art, and you can see at the top of the work, you see the word pop. First time the word pop appears in, in a work of art. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, this, this idea of pop culture, you know, he's sourcing from magazines that actually um, American soldiers gave to him. Um, and so kind of collaging and definitely making statements um, in terms of culture, reflecting on culture, um, kind of the bombardment of images that was going on at this time period, still today, you know, we're bombarded by images all the time. Um, but he's uh, really, he was really interested at this time period, like all PARP artists, again, and sort of using ephemera um, as um, elements to, to their art. But with this one, it, it's a little bit of a, not kind of this happy-go-lucky tone, as you might see in like Roy Lichtenstein um, or Andy Warhol. You know, we think of Andy Warhol when we think of pop art, which is happening in the 60s. This is happening, you know, 20 years ahead of that. So really seen as a pioneer, right, kind of like our, our friend Randall, you know, kind of the Lone Ranger, like the Lone Ranger. I feel like, like Paolo Tsi is kind of this like pop ranger um, in the art world, you know, kind of paving the way. Um, he was also part of a group called the Independent Group. Again, sort of this group of young artists who, who were looking at this impact of technology, mass, mass uh, production, popular col culture, and what that was doing um, to art. And in 1952, a few years later, he gave this lecture um, called bunk. And this whole idea of bunk as a word is a Henry Ford uh, euphemism. So Henry Ford said that, um, when he was obviously doing his thing. And I wanna make sure I'm quoting this right because it's it's a good quote um, from Henry Ford. And so he said, history is more or less bunk. Um, we want to live in the present. So that's what he's, what Paluzzi is kind of saying, like everything that came before is whatever, like I'm talking about the now. Um, so again, really focused on, on the now. Um, even though now he's like credited with like founding this really uh, influential art movement that spread um, to the US as well. He also, he continued to work and kind of changed his style and, and experimented in different media. Um, this is a part of a large, like huge of uh, sculpture work in Edinburgh. So he, he really stayed true to his roots and he donated the bulk of kind of his um, own personal collection to the National Gallery of Modern Art in Edinburgh. And he also 
um, did a commission piece, this work, um, and there's a hand and an ankle that go with this piece, um, large scale sculpture in front of um, St. Mary's Church in Edinburgh. I call the manuscript of Monte Cassino and a lot um, in the other work that he we this looked at there's some dark overtones to this for sure um, not very not a feminist piece by any means. Um, but kind of commenting on the objectification of women um, the the impact of war um, the impact of violence um, so this this does kind of come back to a theme and this particular work is sort of. Um, named after Monte Cassino, which was a monastery. Um, in 1944 that was um, destroyed um, by a bombing raid. And so this is sort of um, a commentary on the violence of war and the impact of war. Um, so he, he also is making like overt, you know, statements uh, with his work, um, you know, when he's not kind of being joyous and fun. So it just shows kind of the gamut of what he was, what he was doing in his work. Um, so kind of coming back to um, our moon, uh, moon news empire, moonbeam news empire, which again sounds like a very cigar UFO kind of situation that we have going on at Bonnie Dune as well. And Bonnie Dune, this is why I like, I'm like, please let it be a Scottish name because again, it fits so well uh, with our story um, of Eduardo. But again, a hundred prints in this box, this pink box. And so I just show you a couple more examples from that same series. Um, to just show the range of kind of his composition and the style he's working with. So on the left, a very, you know, ge geometric, again, still very playful in the color palette that he's choosing. In the middle, we have some images from like movie stills. There's Einstein here. Um, in the back, a rocket ship. So another reference to kind of space. Um, and then the other print, um, is uh, showcasing some like in the middle sort of engines, sort of kind of combustible engines. So again, that, that technology, a lot of car references are in this box and then facial expressions and then pairing up with these like Disney-esque uh, kind of creatures here at the bottom, maybe Pluto, a little mini, a uh, little Donald Duck action happening. And the Disney reference, you know, again, pretty purposeful. Um, again, he's kind of pulling from that cultural pop culture, especially in the 1960s. Um, so I cannot, you know, if we're looking at a pink elephant, I cannot not reference uh, Dumbo. Um, if we're talking about Disney and we're talking about um, drinking and pink <laughs> elephants, you know, uh, it's, it's again, a thing, you know, it's definitely a thing. Um, so if you, Dumbo incidentally, 1941, this comes out. So this is like right before he's making his first bunk uh, collage series, which is pretty interesting. Um, I will tell you as a kid, like I've, I've seen Dumbo once in my life and it was it like this scene is why I've only seen that movie once because it's super creepy. I don't know if anyone else feels the same about it. <laughs> But, you know, Dumbo, so Dumbo and Timothy, you know, they have a, they have a water, they think they're drinking water, but it's, it's been spiked with champagne. And so they get drunk off of this champagne and uh, he's Dumbo like hiccups and, and blows a balloon, uh, a, a bubble out of his um, trunk and it turns into a pink elephant. And then we get this whole like five minute sequence of just like freaky elephant stuff happening. Good <laughs> and and very much like fourth wall breaking in a way. So you see this. Um, oh, hi, mama. <laughs> can you um, no shh, no go? Can you please go see daddy? Okay, sorry. Speaking of breaking that fourth wall. Perfectly <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> you know, after after eight months of doing this program, first time. So anyway, uh, so where was I? Um, so as we're uh, looking, so definitely breaking the fourth wall. So in this kind of still, you see the pink elephant sort of marching along the square right of our screen, um, and Dumbo's watching it. So Dumbo almost like joins us in observation, and I kind of you know like like that idea of with this elephant sort of doing the same, you know, he's, his eye is sort of like 
looking at us, sort of kind of breaking breaking that that wall. Um, and he's to me like I'd rather spend time with with the elephant that Pulazzi has shown us than than like the pink elephants, <laughs> the Dumbo. He just seems a lot more fun and carefree. <laughs> um, um, not as not as scary to me. Um, and pink elephant as a term actually started um, as a literary uh, term by Jack London. So he he says this in an autobiographical autobiographical uh, novel, John Barleycorn. Um, and I'm going to quote it for you because I didn't know this, and it was just fun to share. There are broadly speaking two types of drinkers. There is the man whom we all know, stupid, unimaginative, whose brain is bitten numbly by numb maggots, that's kind of rough, um, who is generally widespread, tentative legs, falls frequently in the gutter, and who sees in the extremity of his ecstasy blue mice and pink elephants. Um, and that's how this started. So that kicked off in like 1913 and then just sort of sprung off from there and sort of became associated with being like hallucinatory kind of uh, stages of, of drinking. I don't know if that's what he, uh, Palazzo was drawing upon. Um, again, maybe referencing kind of this idea again as a euphemism in popular culture, um, which he is drawing from for his entire series in a box. Um, but also the word, the title for mica, um, you know, if we think about for mica as a material, very popular in the 60s on countertops and had kind of like these loop-de-loop -loop crazy geometric patterns. And we sort of see that in the background um, of this elephant who is joyfully dancing and eating a peanut. Um, so a lot of humor. Um, and again, you know, it's kind of seeing things on a closer look. There's a lot happening again with the patterns and the color and the shift in this work, like in that label with, with Bonnie Doom. And so I, I wish I could just send this to Randall and see what he thinks. I don't know, Robert, maybe you know him. Maybe you can make that happen. Uh, we could probably make it happen. Okay. <laughs> can I ask you a question about this? Because yeah. I have a lot of questions now. This is very interesting. With, um, was it the box a one-off? Did he make multiple versions of the same box? Did he do different boxes? And yeah, that's a great question. So there, there are multiple versions, uh, not versions, but um, they're um, prints of this box. Um, so most major museums have this in their collection. So the Tate, for example, San Francisco, Art Institute of Chicago, um, and we have it. Um, so it is, it is around. And so you can see that um, in this he has signed um, several of the prints in the box and will notate kind of uh, print run number. So like this one, and I can't see it very closely, it might be like 99 of, of, of something. So um, yeah, there are definitely versions floating out. He did do a sequel, um, a sequel, a part two. Uh, so sorry, I'm in the movie, in the movie sphere here, um, but it's Moon Moon Empire, Moonrise, not Moonrise, that's a different movie. See, I got to get off the movie kick, um, but it's volume two and we actually have that as well. Um, so you can see the whole series on our website. If you go into our collection search and type in um, um, uh, Polizzi, um, and again, I can go back and, and show you his name so you can see. So that's how you spell it and you type that in. You can see the entire two boxes. Um, so we have an image of each of the work. And again, it's, it's, it's really varied. There are some that are just um, full page words from like scientific manuals. There are some that are in black and white, but really this color scheme of these like pinks and greens and like neons um, are definitely the predominant scheme that you'll find, especially in that neon pink, neon pink box. I would love to just see it. I would just love to see the, the box kind of like stacked up. Um, and um, someone's mentioned the 60s also drew psychedelic references to Disney and art. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I think he's, he's definitely capitalizing on that for, for these works. Thank you. Gonna, Everyone's just coming in my, coming in my, my area right now. Um, so <laughs> Liz? I just had a, I wanted to go back and answer a few chats that hadn't been yeah. Um Bonnie, do you no longer makes musk a day? Uh, and I would say as far as out in national distribution, yes, uh, you, you are not going to be able to buy their Muscaday in stores. Um, I'm not honestly sure if they are going to continue to make it uh, as a winery only option. I did look on the website. There is not a Muscaday for sale at the moment on their website, um, but it does look like they have library wines on some 
like 2016, 2017, 2018 wines. Um, but they still do have a wine club and that would probably be where you would find those types of bottles. And most wineries have wines that they make that are for wide distribution. And then they have smaller production stuff that they sell exclusively on the property and or in a direct to consumer model where you're a part of like their wine club uh, type thing. And I think that's where you'll find uh, those more classic ones that they used to make. Oh, but you did see that their tasting room was closed. I did actually, yep, I looked at that too. Uh, it's at the Davenport um, one, so I don't know. Is there are multiple. Yeah, it just says visit. When you click visit, it says, we are sad to announce that the permanent closure of our beautiful tavern, Davenport tasting room on December 23rd, 2019. So probably still have a premise one. I would think, but again, I don't actually, I don't know that I can answer that. Uh, I'm giving this to you to show everyone how to open this weirdo wine. Yeah, so this has a glass stopper, uh, which has become kind of trendy in some rosés, and especially with uh, the winemaker, Gerard Bertrand. He is also the winemaker for Cote de Roses, if you've ever had that. Uh, that's the one that has, similar to this, an etching in the bottom, but it is of yeah. Like that shape. It's big. It's a big it's bottle. It's like a big bottom yeah. and a skinny top on it. And yes, exactly. And it looks like a rose. Man, I don't have enough nails to get this <laughs> started. <love> these, <laughs> so yeah, so definitely grab that and start working on opening that if you have that at home and want to taste it along with us. Okay. Oh, so I there's a, you can get it. Uh, there's, there's a little tab that usually comes off easier, but not always. Oh, no. Do you oh. want my key? No, I thought I had my knife, but I don't have that either. Yeah, I can get that. There we go. That's it. There you go. There we go. All right. So eventually, once you can get the plastic off, which is the hardest part of opening <laughs> any wine. Oh my gosh. I can't do that. <laughs> it's only happening because you're being so. I know. <laughs> That's always how it goes. There we go. All right. Maybe. There you go. There it is. All right. Once you get the plastic off, that's the hardest part. Uh, then you'll see there's just a little uh, gap, and you can just take your fingers in there and bing, off it goes. Uh, and it's great because you can recap them. Yeah. There, it really does make a nice seal for when you put it back in your fridge. You really have to push to get it on there, but it does also come right back now, nice oh, and you, easily. Sam. You're really welcome. And so this is a really fun one. So Gerard Bertrand, this is a uh, French winemaker. Uh, he is actually a retired professional football player um, who turned winemaker 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, is in his uh, family as well. He mostly makes wine from the south of France, um, but his big focus has become organic, sustainable, natural. Every wine that he is making and putting out, we've had four new wines come in from him this year. All of them have been uh, focused on that. So he's a huge proponent of that. This is a fun partnership that he did or does with Jesse Bongiovi. Um, you might not recognize him. Uh, that is actually how you say their last name. Um, but you might recognize his father whose stage name is John Bongiovi. Um, and so this is Hampton water. And the idea is if you're in the Hamptons, you don't really drink water, you drink in rosé. And this is the water that you have when you're in the Hamptons. Uh, it's delicious. Yeah, I mean, all- All, all, all marketing aside, yeah. it's <laughs> really well-made wine. It really is. <laughs> yeah, I, I there's think, Gerard. Uh, I think if you brought this to me and didn't tell me what it was or showed me the bottle, I would think it was a very serious wine. Yes. And then when you see the bottle and know the story behind it, it gives it some levity, so. Yeah. And you'll see those of you that are tasting, this is bigger in every way. I was gonna say like that, I definitely f smell the fruit on this much more than I did the other mm -hmm. one. It's just like super aromatic. Super aromatic, bigger mouthfeel, yeah. more spice, more the um, more strawberry. I don't know if that's yes, <laughs> uh, I mean, more fruit without it being fruit forward. I don't yeah, know if that's yeah. the way to say it. It's yeah, still more, super dry. It's still super dry. Still, I still, never know how to talk about that. Yeah, it's uh, that's a tough one because yeah, you, you can't you wouldn't say sweet because mm -hmm. it's not. Because it may even be drier. I don't know what the residual sugar content and is. And you don't want to say it's fruity because then people think it's going to be, you know, I don't know, like yeah. tutti fruity. I don't know. It, it's, it is classic Cote de Provence. Um, it's uh, exactly what you would expect. And the grapes are uh, similar to the last ones. 
Grenache, Senso, Mouvedre, and Syrah. Um, those are the most typically and, and uh, commonly used grapes to make rosé, uh, no matter what part of the world you're in. Um, but but the, this, this part, um, just to pull the map up, just to orient us a little bit too, on kind of where the grape comes from, or where he's, Bertrand is coming from. Mm -hmm. So in our Languedoc Rousson, there we go, on the, that uh, Mediterranean, I believe, coast there. Um, so it's the south of France. That's where all the French go. That's when, um, is it July or August when Paris closes? August. Mm -hmm. August. Everyone leaves France. If you're not, we should all be jealous. Uh, <laughs> they literally, as a whole country, basically all get the month of August off and they all, like businesses close. Like if you were to try and go vacation there and go to Paris, you would not have as much to do because they're on vacation. I've done that before. By accident. <laughs> that's how I know it's August. <laughs> that's where they all go vacation. That's the, you know, you're not far from, because what, uh, where's Monaco? Monaco's not far from mm -mm. that. It's like right on the other side of that little map there. So you're in like, you know, billionaire cruise ship world. Um, and kind of like the Hamptons. Kind of like the Hamptons. Yeah, very similar. This is a great photo kind of on the vineyard. Yeah. So, you know, actually doing the work. Actually doing work. And I will say, so uh, if you, if there, there's some links you can read about. Um, so uh, Jesse uh, Bon Jovi uh, was finishing up uh, college with a business degree and he and a friend uh, went to the Provence region and vacationed and just fell in love with that style of wine in that area. And um, they were finishing up their degrees, not really sure what they wanted to do. Obviously they have some opportunities that we're not all afforded. But um, uh, uh, John asked Jesse, what, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to import rosé. Like, I think that'd be awesome. You know, and he goes, okay, well, figure it out, come up with a plan. And he developed the idea for Hampton Water. Uh, I'm not sure who connected Gerard with them, but uh, it, it's pretty cool and pretty impressive for a young guy to uh, take all that on and come up with it. And it really, to honestly even see Bon Jovi's name, you really have to read very yeah. small in the fine print. It is not something, obviously in their digital marketing, it's not too hidden, but as far as if you were shopping it at a store, yeah. you have to be told uh, that it was. Yeah. Uh, they're not using that as its main selling point. So good. It really is so good. I mean, it is really good, yeah. Very plants too, because I get a little bit of that green quality in it. Like almost that, like you were talking about earlier, Celeste, with kind of wet garden. Yeah. We get a little bit of that, like, yeah. strawberry plant. Yeah, like that the, the rain. I don't herbaceousness. Know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. So again, snacky time. I apologize. <laughs> this picture is horrible and the salad is lovely. <laughs> and I didn't realize till it was big. <laughs> it's bad, so I apologize. But the salad, Cheney, who is our sous chef, if you all haven't met her yet, she is lovely and very talented. And she did this watermelon salad. And we all tried it last night and it's fabulous. We got these really cool local sugar snap peas and um, they're purple peas. I got one of my oh, CSA boxes. I thought those were like anchovies. And green beans or anchovies. I know, it's the worst <laughs> picture. But um, they're green beans. I mean, they're peas and they're fabulous. So they have like a purple outside shell and super sweet inside. Mm -hmm. And I know they have them at the farmer's markets this week because I got it in my CSA box last week. So I know <laughs> they're around, so they're fabulous. And then just your classic watermelon salad with some very good local bib lettuce and a champagne vinaigrette. And she made boiled peanuts and then she candied them. And they're mm -hmm. awesome. We should have done Ooh. that with the elephant. I should have with the elephant. Well, we can keep going, it's fine. Well, it's great. And then um, our deviled eggs with, with uh, salmon roe, which Yum. is- awesome with a little breadcrumb and um, avocado mm. along the bottom. I mean, it almost kind of looks like the label, like the salmon row would be the sun, you know, the uh -huh. little pink and then the way, you know. Yeah. I love it. It's uh, not only beautiful like the bottle, but they both taste good mm -hmm. um, and taste very good together. So yeah. another awesome snacking excursion on the patio with your Hampton water mm -hmm. on looking over the beautiful grounds of VMFA. Yeah. And you can wear this while you do it. Oh, you can't it. wear it. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I threw, so I threw this in um, because, again, you know, thinking about pink, and I love that there is watermelon in that salad, Liz, because the central um, stone here on the central wisteria is watermelon tourmaline. So it's it's pears 
So well, yeah, watermelon tourmaline. Um, and we've got garnets and rubies and pearl opals, excuse me, carved opals are here. Um, so the pink here really stands out in the central wisteria. So this is a choker by Philip Wolfers um, that the museum acquired very recently. And it just went on view um, last month in the Art Nouveau galleries. So you can actually, you know, have your watermelon salad, drink your Hampton water, then just walk over the bridge and go see this amazing work of art by um, Philip Wolfers from about 1900. And Philip Wolfers is pictured on the left here. This is another example of his jewelry, unfortunately not in our collection, but I just wanted to, to share it with you to give you kind of um, a range of what he did. He had his um, own firm and he designed and made, he had, um, he did do work for other um, firms as well. And this is him on the left looking, inspecting a piece of jewelry, um, which is kind of nice. Um, and this, uh, we have another, a couple more works in the collection by him. This is a cash coat, really huge thing, huge thing um, that would have a plant in it, this really large plant um, kind of sitting on a poof, a furniture poof. Um, so he did a range of materials. And again, I love this because it's a pink orchid um, as well, or pink iris. Um, and then with this one, just to get and closer into this amazing uh, work of craftsmanship and design. So he created about 190 pieces that were stamped unique. And you can kind of see that um, very, it's hard to read, but trust me, it's there. It says X unique. And um, that means it's one of a kind, a showpiece. So it would have been designed to kind of showcase what the firm could do um, either on view in, the, in a great exposition and then this is his mark here, a P within a W. So we know it's by Philippe Wolfers. Um, this work again um, has two sort of things going, well, it has a lot going for it, uh, but two techniques just to point out, a plique à jour, which I put here is a French term, which means sort of um, uh, light that shines through um, or light of the day. Um, and that just means there's no backing in the enamel. Um, so you can see that the, the enamel, this is the back of the enamel and you can see there, there's no metal um, that obscures the enamel. So light is allowed to peek through um, and it gives it a sense of weightness and you can kind of see the color in the enamel. And then the other thing about this work is that is an entremble piece. Um, and Robert definitely pointed out the hinge here um, on the wisteria very well done, Robert, earlier. Um, and that means that this piece actually um, moves. So while the person would be wearing it on their neck, um, as they're talking or moving their neck, the wisteria would kind of wave back and forth um, all the wisteria pieces. So it's a really amazing feat of engineering as well. Um, and that pink term, that that pink um, watermelon tourmaline, I just had to share this, you know, it can come in a range of colors and intensity. So um, these are all examples of the tourmaline and, and it depends on as the crystal is growing, what minerals it's interacting with and kind of coming in from the ground like wine, you know, um, will kind of flavor um, sort of the appearance of the tourmaline. Um, and it's known as watermelon tourmaline for obvious reasons, especially on, on the left, it looks like pieces of watermelon that have been sliced and that kind of gradation between um, pink and green. And you can see that. Um, so these pieces were selected very carefully um, and, and kind of sculpted to look like wisteria leaves. We're very fortunate, usually um, things like this uh, by Wolfers would have been disassembled after displayed um, and used in other pieces. But thanks to his wife, Sophie, she actually bought this piece um, to retain it. And I'm, at first I was like, come on, you can't give this to your wife. But then I'm thinking, actually, it's very smart and a good business practice because it was made it wasn't made for her, it was made for, for the firm to represent the firm. So actually to keep it legit, it needs to be bought. Um, so they're actually doing good business practice, you know, like Bon Jovi, you know, still made him work for it. Uh, it wasn't a passive aggressive move. <laughs> right, it wasn't passive aggressive. So Sophie saved it um, and uh, came on the market and we were really fortunate to be able to acquire it for the collection. Um, to go with the rest of our jewelry in that case, which actually spent some time looking at because they're pretty phenomenal. And in case you're wondering how would someone wear this work, this is how. It is huge. It's about five inches high. Um, this is not my neck. I wish it was. <laughs> wish it was. 
wish it was, but you can see how that piece, this kind of is laying on the neck. So it has that kind of like movement in it a little bit, which you really have to have because of the size of the work um, and how it would really feel on your neck. So watermelon tourmaline, definitely this pink stone, pink and green stone that I've, you know, that to become a little bit familiar with. And again, this is on view now, so you can go see that in our galleries. Um, and this work too, um, again, when I think of pink in the collection, this is actually the first work that comes to my mind. Um, it recently went off view, I'm sorry to say, but I'm sure it will be back. Um, and the great thing about our collections page and what I love about virtual things like this, it gives you the opportunity to showcase things that you might not be able to see all the time on view. So you can really get the breadth of our collection um, or favorites like this, um, which is, uh, and I'm not gonna say the German cause I don't wanna slaughter it, but English translation is six dancers from 1911 by Ernst Kirchner. This is a favorite for a lot of our classes, uh, our classes for youth and early childhood or really anybody. It just always delights uh, when you see this in the gallery and it's super, super pink, uh, dominant theme in this work. And I love that like the, the label of Hampton Water is, you know, a, a woman in motion, so diving. Um, so I love that these are in motion too, but, but a little bit static. And we'll talk about why in a little bit. But I want to tell you a little bit about the artist um, Ernst Kushner on the left here. This is a self a portrait, a self a photograph from 1919. And also the story of how this work came into the collection, which is really fascinating. So on the right are Ludwig and Rosie Fischer, who were collectors in Germany. And they collected work by Kirchner and a lot of De Broeke or the bridge artists um, who were practicing at the time. Um, like Max Ernst is another example who you'll see in the collection. And they, they displayed these works in their house. Um, these huge paintings were on their walls in their dining room. Um, she kind of opened her own gallery and invited people. Um, they passed away in the late 20s, about 1926. And they left their collection to their two sons, Max, and Ernst. So divided it into half. Um, not sure how they did it, but they did. Um, I don't know if the boys got to pick their favorites. Um, so that happened. And then in, um, of course, you know, they're a Jewish family in the 1930s in Germany. So in 1935, um, Ernst and his wife flee Germany um, to come to the United States and bring their collection with them, pack up their collection, bring it with them. And they settle in Richmond, Virginia, um, because Ernst got a job at MCV. He was a doctor. And Anne, his wife, Anne and, Anne and Ernst came and settled. This is Anne at age 102 in 2004. She actually passed away in 2008. So it was 106 when she passed away. And she became uh, really a um, important fixture in the Jewish community in Richmond. She received several humanitarian awards. She went back at age 40 um, to school and got a social work degree and really made a difference in the community. Um, and, you know, art was still very central to their core. And, and at, after she passed, she bequeathed the entire collection uh, to the museum. So it came to the museum uh, around about then. And I love this photograph of Ernst and Anne's children, Eva and George. Um, who are standing in front of the six dancers uh, who was in, you know, that was in their collection um, and is now at the museum. And thank you, Kristen. Kristen just popped in a link if, um, to know more detail about this story. Um, we have a great collection story on our website where you can watch a video interview with Ann Fisher um, and learn more about the breadth of the collection, which numbers over like 150 pieces from paintings to etchings. Um, so it's really well worth a a deep dive. Um, the other image that you see here just came to the collection um, into the museum's collection a couple years ago um, as a restitution um, case. And the restitution of works of art that were looted by Nazi uh, Nazi soldiers, um, you know, is is still going on. Um, and we're really fortunate at the museum to have an expert in this work, um, Karen Daly. So I'm going to give her a shout out in our registration department. Um, and we're still, um, this is still kind of uh, coming to fruition because Max, so Ernst's brother, um, who received the other half of the connect collection was a journalist and he was in America when really things were coming to a head in Germany and he couldn't come back to Germany. So his, his part of the collection was looted and lost. 
And so they're still um, trying to find it, including this work, which was found in MoMA's collection. And this is a very detailed story that I do not have time to get into, but this is The Hills at Grinnell by Kirshner. So the same artist who did obviously are our, our six dancers. And you can see this kind of this pink again, these really saturated colors. And this was really key in the De Bruker movement or the, and who was influenced by the Fovis movement. Um, and Kirshner, again, you know, they're, they're rallying against impressionism, right, which is these soft like colors and soft brushworks and moving into this expressionist style depicting landscape, but also things that are happening, you know, in dance halls or, or, or ballets like this. Um, and so we see this sort of um, abstracted qualities. Um, you may get hints, uh, reminiscence of like Cezanne or Picasso, who's, who again is being influenced here. And he's sort of um, skirting reality again. So their, their dresses are pink, but he's painted their whole bodies this kind of same shade. So it's sort of, um, and they're sort of stilted in these movements. They almost look like dolls. Um, and there's sort of a cadence to the work though too. So they're all, their arms are the same way, the legs are the same way, their heads are tilted the same way. And they're kind of like dancing, you know, right across that, that foreground there um, in, in this work. So again, very fortunate to have this, this piece in the collection. We just were, um, so that the Hills of Grinnell came to us in 2014 from Max's collection. And we just received another work um, in 2020 from Max's collection as well, uh, which is a landscape. Um, yes, Sand Hills on Grinnell is on view as well. Um, so, so you can definitely come and see this work in person. I'd encourage you to do so. Again, I replicating the colors is, is a little tough in images. Um, so it's a great story. Again, you can read a lot more details of that in that collection story. That's on the floor where the where the dancers used to be is in that same gallery. Yes, in the same gallery. So the gallery that's right off of um, the main atrium in the museum. Um, so you can, yeah. So if you come in, um, so right now the um, as you're maybe going to see Dirty South, it, it's kind of right off of the atrium there. So you can see the hills of Grinnell uh, there, and hopefully the dancers will be back on view. So um, again, if you if you have seen dancers before um, or any impressions of this work too happy to see those in the chat again this is a super favorite um, when we for our early childhood um, programs uh, because of the color because of the subject matter it's even though they're a little stilted or look like dolls it is to me it's a very joyous work i think because of that that color and expression um, so it's it's a great note to kind of in the evening on, because I, I feel like too, Rosé and a lot of all of these works to me, um, again, the story behind them, um, why this one is a little hard, but there's a happy ending here. Um, and, you know, for me, Rosé makes me very happy. <laughs> it's a very happy kind of line. Um, and, you know, all the works I've shown today have some sort of, of joy associated with them. And, and I hope a happy ending. So chin chin to that. I'm going to have a little more, more sip. Thank you. That was lovely. Of the Hampton uh, line, but happy to, to take any uh, any other comments um, or questions. I just to read them back. Um, Tammy says, "Great story." Susan says, "Unbelieving, moving. I am crying." Thank you. Yes, it's an amazing, amazing story of the collection and the family, mm -hmm. um, and their dedication to you know art and and their willingness to share it uh, with Virginia by by get by you know making it available publicly is is really amazing as well. So Robert and Liz, thank you so much for introducing us to these two delightful wines. Again, um, two very different, but I, but I love the story behind both of them. Yeah, I think it's interesting that they're different, but they have some similar qualities, but they're mm -hmm. kind of way different parts of the world. So mm -hmm. I think that that's pretty interesting to taste yeah. rosé from California and Rosé from France and see how they're similar and different with some of the same grapes. Yeah, I was just saying with some of the some of the same grapes. Yeah, same I mean, back then for sure. For sure, you know mm -hmm. the Grenache and the Senso, um, and both. And Randall is a self-professed Francophile. Uh, from the beginning, he uh, I was rereading the bio for a second while we we're sitting here trying to find something else out, and you know it said he initially tried to be Burgundy, you know, but realized that's not possible. Yeah. 
um, again, because it's not cold in California, uh, or at least in the wine regions. Um, and so this is what he's trying to emulate. Susan picked out your pink. Yeah. <laughs> I attempted. I don't know if it's just- got pink parrots. You got pink parrots. <laughs> yeah, I try, I try to match what I'm talking about. I had to. I, think I, almost, I almost wear my pink uh, rose. I have these pink sunglasses that are just pink lenses. I almost went there. But. <laughs> um, so next taste of art, and I'm seeing a typo already. Sorry about that. And thank you, Kristen, who always keeps me, keeps me on task here. Um, the next taste of art is actually June 29th. Sorry about that. Um, with Lost Rhino Brewery out of Northern Virginia. Um, and my colleague Izzy Fuqua is going to be hosting that one. So thanks in advance to Izzy. And then on July 9th, uh, we're going to be joined um, by Rich Wines RVA, a really cool company um, that focuses on minority owned and organic uh, wine producers and based in Richmond. So we'll get to hear her sto their story. I'm so excited to host them um, in July. So again, thank you everyone who joined us this evening. Again, special thanks to Robert for joining us from Robin Sellers. And Liz, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Um, and for those great food pairings, I'm gonna have to come in and try some of those salads. Um, and I hope everyone has a great evening and enjoy the wine. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.